Right? There's two toilet portions today. Because oh, it's not a leap year to join together. So I condensed them. And then JP's not feeling too hot. So I've kind of expanded them again. So we're going to do it over three bits. But um, <clears throat> it's the, we're going to go to the end of Exodus. And it's Vaikal and Padukai. So shall we begin? Right, Genesis told the tale of 24 generations and the book of Exodus chronicles just the one. So, <clears throat> you know, in Genesis we've got all kinds of stuff going on. We've got all these massive mammoth tales, we've got the flood, we've got all kinds of stuff. But this is just one generation all the way through the book. So, we ask ourselves, why did Jehovah choose this particular generation? And is it possible that what sets them apart from most other generations is an understanding that was birthed in slavery? That if Jehovah did not redeem them in his power, redemption simply would not come. They were people whose only hope was the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And in the midst of such a people, Jehovah would not have to share his glory with anyone, would he? Okay. Now the revelation of the glory of Jehovah is an absolutely critical part of his plan for the redemption of mankind. And somewhere deep within all of us, whether we know it or not, the same plea that Moshe made, which was show me your glory, is our most passionate plea as well. And there's people out there who don't even know what they're missing in their lives who are crying out. They just don't even know what it is that they're missing. Now he always chooses those who know that they in themselves have nothing eternal or meaningful to offer anyone. And they will not claim the credit when Jehovah works wonders and redeems men. He's not looking for people who are full of themselves who think they're brilliant. And look what I've got to offer God, I'll do it for you. That's <laughs> not what he's after. He always chooses those who do not need or desire a stage. He's not looking for people who are looking for an opportunity to get up and go, <laughs> He doesn't look for people who want a spotlight, a title, or a ministry to make them feel important or fulfilled. He always chooses those who need Him and Him alone. Those who do not clamor for the anointing, but for the anointer. There's a big difference, isn't there? Because there's people who want to, Oh, I'm going to be the special one, I'm going to be the special one. No, hang on. The attitude is, you're the special one, and I just want you. He always chooses those who allow themselves to be overshadowed and overwhelmed by his glory and fall down on their faces to worship him. Now think about it, Moshe is described as the most humble man on the earth. That's incredible, isn't it? The most humble man on the earth, and yet he was chosen. Well, we've seen what he was chosen for, he penned the Torah. And he led the people out of Egypt. He was the most humble man on the earth. That's the people that the Lord's interested in. Remember what he said? He said, I'm not going to do a lisp. What if Ali couldn't speak very well? Can't thank me, Lord. <laughs> he, he, didn't, he didn't want to go, did he? He wasn't like, yes, yeah, send me, I'll be boss. I'll have a word of the fair. I'll sort it out. That wasn't where he was coming from. He knew he was nothing without Jehovah. That's the people that the Lord's looking for. Now where are we at in the Torah portion? <clears throat> in the aftermath of the golden calf, the people's dreams of building a perfect community of faith have been destroyed. Let's all get together folks, let's get together and have a big party and celebrate and let's get all spiritual. Yeah man, that's what they were doing wasn't it? Isn't this great, everybody together and it didn't go well. After the humiliation, the guilt, because you imagine the guilt when Moshe turns up <clears throat> and the bloodshed that followed it. We know what happened, only 3,000 people lost their lives. They've now had their fill of, and are probably terrified of as well, the whole concept of community life. It went that badly. Oh. So what happens, we read in Exodus 33, 8. It came to pass when Moshe went out unto the tabernacle, that all the people rose up and stood every man at his tent door and looked after Moshe until he was gone into the tabernacle just after that and all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door and all the people rose up and worshipped every man in his tent door they all withdrew from this whole idea of fellowship and community together because it went so terribly wrong now 
what started the downward spiral of the golden calf nonsense? Well, bizarrely enough, it all started with the words Vayikel Hatman, however you say it, <coughs> I, and the people gathered together. Okay, that was in Exodus 32 1. Now, note the similarity, the open word of the whole golden calf incident, i.e., Vayikel, to the open word of this week's Parsha, and in fact its name, which is Vayakel. Both contain the same verb root, which is Kal, meaning to gather together. So we've had this gathering together and it results in the golden calf nonsense. And we're just about to start our Torah portion now with the same word by a cow, a gathering together. So we've got to think to ourselves, oh no, <laughs> is it going to go the same way or are we going to see something different? Now, <clears throat> in Barsha Kitiza, this is what happened. The people gathered together of their own accord for their own purposes I see Terry laughing because he's seen the picture. <laughs> According to their own notions, right? Not as a Shema response to Jehovah's voice or in a manner set forth by the Torah. They were just, yeah, let's do this. It all sounds good. It all sounds great. Remember the Golden Calf incident? They actually said, we make a feast to Jehovah. This is great. Slap his name on it. It's cool. You'll be made up with this. <laughs> it didn't go that way, did it? Now, the result was disaster. <clears throat> I've got a picture up here which is absolutely nuts. It's Visit Florence, procession of Easter carts in Florence. It just looks mad. I've no idea what they're doing, but that is just nuts, isn't it? It says, anyway, the result was, of course, disaster. We've read about it, haven't we? And after the gathering, assembling of the people bore its natural and inevitable fruit which was misrepresentation of the essence of Jehovah, false altar building, idolatrous worship practices and death. The camp at Sinai was reduced to a jumble hodgepodge of individual tents. Okay, now there's a lot of misrepresentation of the essence of Jehovah going on, isn't there? There's a lot of people gathering and assembling, building false altars. Um, there's a lot of idolatrous worship being practiced. And it's not where the Lord wants us to be. Man's idea of association, assembly, and community produced for these people as it produces for all people who walk in it. Only a golden calf, a civil war, a fragmentation of their hearts, their minds, and their souls. Loads of people in the tent doors thinking, what went wrong? Now, I've got a little diagram here, which is uh, the major branches within Christianity. I just thought it was nuts because it's. <laughs> The big schisms happened where there was a council, where there was a gathering. It's like, okay, this is good, isn't it? It's exactly the same thing. The community completely broken down. Why? Because people gathered together under their own steam, with their own notions. Nothing to do with a response to his voice or anything that's instructed in Torah. And the flip side is, in Acts 2, 46, they continued daily with one accord in the temple breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. The early church had it right. Why did they have it right? Because they stuck to the word of God. It says, doesn't it, they followed the teachings of the disciples who just followed the word of God. So, following their own ideas, ignoring Jehovah and his word, had gone horribly wrong. Everything was fragmented and everyone was at the tent door. Okay. So perhaps it was for the sake of restoration that they'd entered a temporary phase of every man at the entrance of his own tent. You can kind of understand it, can't you? Like, you know, having seen, imagine the disgrace of, oh, actually, yeah, that was really stupid. 3,000 people murdered in your own camp. The realization that this God who's done all these things for you set you free, wow. Split the Red Sea, all the amazing things he's done. He's still providing manna from heaven and it's like and the water. And he's gone and done this. And it was like the, he made it so clear to me too. He said, Don't make any idols or anything like that. It wasn't like it was a bit mythy and a bit, oh, we could interpret that a different way. He just went ahead and did it. There must have been a real sense of, oh, this is awful. I just want to hang my head in shame and hide somewhere. Now Participating in community for the sake of community is every bit as idolatrous a practice as dancing before the golden calf. If it's just a bunch of people calling themselves God's people, think about this. 
gathered together of their own accord for their own purposes according to their own notions not as a small response that means hearing and obeying to Jehovah's voice or in a manner set forth by the Torah then it's just the golden calf all over again there's golden calves all over the country because people are gathering together for their own purposes of their own accord according to their own notions it's men doing their own thing and expecting God to bless it just because they fluffed it up and made it seem nice put a few nice little Jesus stickers on it said the right thing made the right cake and they expect him somehow to be pleased with it and he looks at it and all he sees is idolatry idolatry and so when one of your holders redeemed recognizes that a community or organization of other redeemed persons in which he or she has taken part is either participating in or is on the road toward a golden calf type of worship which is divorced from the Torah of Jehovah and therefore misrepresenting Jehovah to the world it's an essential part of his plan for that person to do as the redeemed community did back then go and stand in your tent door and withdraw yourself from that community Revelation 18 4 says and I heard another voice from heaven saying come out of here my people that ye be not partakers of her sins and that ye receive not of her plagues now if your home has called you to a place to reach his people then by all means go and get them and then withdraw with them as well don't get caught up in man driven schemes with people who misrepresent the God of the scriptures because it won't end well and that goes on all the time gathered little groups of people who pat each other on the back and think they've got it all together but if God's not in it, he wants to be a part of it, I don't now this partial shows the difference between a gathering called by men and a gathering called by Jehovah the first brings the golden calf, the second sees all the people bonding together in one purpose, there's your unity when the Lord's in it and doing as Jehovah has asked ultimately this leads to Jehovah dwelling amidst them as his presence fills the tabernacle in a big way it's we're going to be reading about the best time ever in the wilderness it's just like it gets swoony it's just oh but it all comes from the fact that Jehovah called these people and then obeyed his voice in this portion the people build the tabernacle according to all Jehovah's instructions, get that, all of his instructions. There's not a bit where one of the skilled craftsmen says, Do you know what? I'm just gonna do it my way. You know that angel on the top of the Ark of the Covenant? What if I stick a little bit of a hat on him with a funny angle? That looks cool. None of that nonsense is going on according to all of his instructions. And it will be done both in his name and for his glory. And like I said, there's things going on all over the country that people slap his name all over. But it's got nothing to do with it, and it's certainly not for his glory. So what can we learn? <clears throat> During this part here, we will build exactly what Jehovah instructs us to build. We will build it where he instructs us to build it. Instructs us. <laughs> that was good, wasn't it? I just invented a new word. When he instructs us to build it, how he instructs us to build it, we will follow the divine blueprint Jehovah gave us in every detail. We will build it and he will come and fill it with his manifest presence. So, what can we learn? <clears throat> According to his divine blueprint, that's how we're to build things. So you do that when we, we get busy with our own ideas and I go, oh yeah, that'll be really, it's not really cool. And I saw the thing the other day, but I think it was 119 Ministries, and it said, whose kingdom are you building? Is it yours or is it his? And for whose glory are you doing it? Is it for yours or is it for his? Well, if it's for yours and it's your kingdom, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> it's not going to last and the Lord's not going to be a part of it I want to build something that he comes and fills with his divine presence now why do Christians keep building everything except what he instructed them to build 
and they do build some magnificent things, don't they? There's a little thing in the bottom that says, in a typical week, more than five million people attend mega churches across America. These places, they're like, I don't know, they're like auditoriums, aren't they? It's, I don't know, from what I can see, of the bits I've seen, it's just like a big entertainment show. Doesn't seem to have anything to do with, you know, over. Anyway. Now, <clears throat> Christendom, this is all the people who call themselves Christians, we have assault, right, every imaginable kind of Christian institution and world ministry. Mm-hmm. Listened and built something with it. And, but we've unfortunately built these things after the pattern of the prevailing political and sociological institutions of secular society around us. Can't offend the world. Oh no. We have to our shame built in his name successful business ventures with multi-million dollar budgets administrative boards, employees, and retirement plans. Wow, I bet he's made up, I bet he looks down and goes, look what they've done, isn't that fabulous? And yet that which he told us to build remains for the most part confined to words on a dusty tour scroll. People are just not interested in what he wants to build. They can say they are, but they're just not. Because if they were, everything would look completely different. And it's sad, isn't it? There's so many people who put so much energy into all the wrong things. Just get on your knees, be humble and ask, what is it that you want me to do? Read his word and follow it. And there we go. People clamour to these places and they get a nice, warm, emotional, fuzzy feeling and they think that's the Spirit of God. We'll read later what the Spirit of God manifestly dwelling in a place actually looks like. It doesn't look like this. Or this. <clears throat> right, so what's going on? Perhaps your over has been waiting for a particular generation. Just as he did then. Perhaps he's waiting for one now. 2015, perhaps. Now what will this generation look like and what kind of a people is Jehovah looking for? Tea drinking people. (laughs) (laughs) A people who like those at Sinai know that they have no hope of redemption but Jehovah. Yeah? A people who will neither seek nor claim nor accept for themselves one iota of the glory that belongs to Jehovah. These are the people he's after. This people will have no other agenda but to assert his words, to build their lives upon his toilet. However unpopular it is, however many people turn around and say, Money and play, you know. This is his people. Assorting his words and building their lives upon the Torah. Let the Torah and the Messiah, who is its embodiment, not their ministry or their anointing, draw all men who will come. You start walking in the truth. And the Lord will bring the people who are his people. Because he knows who they are and calls his sheep. And his sheep know his voice and they come. We don't have to build some big fancy thing that makes people go, Oh my gosh! With its glitz and its glamour. We don't have to be razzly and dazzly. <laughs> as much as we try it every day. <laughs> we don't. We just follow his words and we give him the glory. And we recognise, without him, we're nothing. Why can Moshe... Call a dat benai Yisrael. That's how it sounds in the Hebrew. If it's spoken by somebody who doesn't speak Hebrew, they <laughs> well, doesn't it? <laughs> Exodus 35, 1. In the English it says this. And Moshe gathered all the congregation of the children of Israel together. Now, most of our English translations of Torah interpret the word Hebrew. Uh, the word Hebrew word that as assembly or congregation. But the very root of it is Eid, which means he testified or he bore witness. The fact that it's got a tav, or the, we see it as a T, on the end, just indicates that there's multiple witnesses, multiple people testifying. Okay? So for Moshe to call the redeemed community together as any dat means that he was, on Jehovah's behalf, calling the many, and what they were like, diverse, fragmented souls, all in the tents, all the words gone wrong. He got called all them together there at Sinai to form a unified witness throng. That's what they are, throng of witnesses. Jehovah's throng of witnesses. So if you read it again, translated more literally from the Hebrew, it says, 
And Moshe called together the entire witness throng made up of Israel's descendants. Okay, and it's just like Yeshua, just before the day of Pentecost, he says to the disciples, doesn't he, and his followers, he says, Ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. That's what we're called to be, witnesses to testify of him. Not testify of ourselves or we've got a fabulous building on the go, you know. And we had a meeting the other day and it was brilliant. Malcolm turned up and he looked really, really healthy. You didn't see him for three weeks. It's that's not it. It's all about I don't know where all that come from. But it's all about testifying of him. Okay? Now throughout the Parsha, Vaikel, the primary focus of the study will be upon the preparations made by Moshe and the children of Israel for and on the actual process and order of constructing the various component parts of the Mishkan. Right, when does all this happen? Okay. It all starts the day after Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement. And it's in the year of the death of Egypt's firstborn. So we've not even gone a year yet since they've all been freed from their slavery. Okay. <clears throat> so what happened on Yom Kippur the preceding day was that Moshe descended Mount Sinai with his face awash in the glory of Jehovah. It was shining like that, wasn't it? And this is the best picture I could find. <laughs> it just looks like somebody's blurred the middle, you know, doesn't it, with a rubber. Looks rubbish. In his hands, he brings down the second set of tablets. It was the best picture of him yet. Now, this is like, if I was going to do the contents, right, this is how it goes. It starts off talking about the Sabbath. Then it's the gifts of the willing heart. Then it's the appointment of the anointed craftsman. And then, on earth as it is in heaven, construction begins. Then we move into the second Torah portion, which has got the record made by Itamar, who is Adam Jungle's son. Then we have the making of the precious garments of beauty and honor, all the priest garments. Then we have the inspection and approval of the essential furnishings and their implements. Then we have the events of the day of consecration and the glory of sin dwelling. Now because there's such a lot in it, I suggest that you read it in your own time, but we're going to be dipping in and out of it so that we're not going to be sat here just because it will go on for like four or five hours if I'd have done that. <coughs> so, the verb phrase by Akel, which the Torah employs to open the first portion, implies that what is actually happening is the fusion of a diverse group of refugees in what is known in Hebrew as a call. So I found an in <coughs> a definition of that. A call represents an eternal community, a communal entity rather, that takes the individuals beyond their personal identities. This is what he's describing as people should be gathered together as. So this is us as well. So we will gather so that <coughs> This communal entity takes the individuals beyond their personal identities and unites them in a new framework, elevating the fundamental bond that joins them together to a level of purpose, destiny, and a common mission that will exist transgenerationally. Now the feminine form of the Hebrew word call is kahila, which is often translated into the Greek language as ecclesia. And then it's, that word's been translated in the New Testament as church. And there's an interesting study you can do on this word. This church doesn't exist in Greek or in Hebrew. It's been placed into selected verses of the New Testament, okay? So many people believe that something new happened, right? It's been left out of certain other verses as well because it didn't want to have any negative connotations towards it. But it's, <clears throat> it's a nonsense. It's, when you start unpicking it, you go, oh, I don't believe you've done that. You can see the bias that's gone into it. And you can see where people get this idea of, well, I was in Israel, and then there was the change. It's like, hang on a minute. It's the same words used all the way through. There's no change whatsoever. Now, when did the church begin? Because a lot of people think it began, um, honestly, about 99% of Christians think it began on the day of Pentecost. <coughs> but even the book of Acts will tell you different. Acts 7.38 this is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in Mount Sinai and with our forefathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us and on the church, the church back in the wilderness see it's the same word this word that is in Greek, Ecclesia and we've just seen there what's being called as a call it's the same word this isn't new, a church, no church, no, no and what is it, we've just had it identified to us it's a bunch of people who are called and unified together because in their unity they're more powerful together and what are they called to be witnesses 
Witnesses of what? Witnesses of his glory. Now, <clears throat> let's read it through for a few verses. It says, And Moshe gathered all the congregation of the children of Israel together, and he said unto them, These are the words which the Lord had commanded that ye should do them. We'll have a look at the word do in a second. And this is, remember, he's just come down off the mountain. His face is shining. People are probably freaking out, going, Wow, look at his face. Okay, and this is the first thing he, he says coming out of his mouth is, Six days shall work be done. Hang on, hang on. Just explain your face first. <laughs> straight in, straight in with the Sabbath commandment. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day there shall be to you a holy day, a Sabbath of rest of the Lord. Whosoever doeth work therein shall be put to death. You shall kindle no fire throughout your habitations upon the Sabbath day. Now, this is interesting. If Moshe is a shadow of the Messiah, then it's interesting that on his first coming, down the mountain, we saw the smashing of the word, okay, which is Yeshua. Yeah, he's the word made flesh, so it's a picture of Messiah, okay, followed by bloodshed and nonsense. On his second coming down the mountain, Moshe is glowing, okay, and he calls the people to keep the Sabbath. What's that? It's a picture of the millennial reign of Christ, which is exactly what Yeshua will do on his second coming. And then what does he start talking about immediately? He starts talking about building the tabernacle. It's like, wow, the pitch is there, wonderful. So, this word do, so let's have a little look. These are the words the Lord commanded that ye should do them. Do them, what does do them mean? <laughs> okay, well do in Hebrew is a saw. This Hebrew verb root literally means not just to do, but it means to fashion, to accomplish, to make and to build, okay? So when Yehovah tells us to assar his words, he means for us to do much more than just do or obey them in a mechanical, legalistic way. He doesn't intend for us to observe them. He certainly doesn't intend for us to fill them, fulfill them. What he intends for us to do with them is to build them. When he says, do my words, he wants us to build them, okay? You make his words, which are the instructions of his Torah, the building blocks of your life and you build something with them for his glory. That's what it means to do his commandments and his words. So the first words are about the Shabbat. First and foremost, Jehovah's great cloud of witnesses are called to be Sabbath commemorators. Okay? He's just calling together and he's calling a great throng of witnesses. Your God's people come together. Bang! The Sabbath. Right? So the first thing Jehovah wants us to know about the building he is calling us to do is that we are only to build when he builds and are to rest with him and in him when he rests. And that's important, not just about the Sabbath as well, that's about important about all the things in your life. Sometimes you, know, <coughs> you think, I've got to do this, and I've got to do that, I've got to speak to someone, I've got to do this, and, I've got to do and we get all heads up and stuff. Hang on a minute. Move as God moves. Get used to listening to his voice. Get used to following his calling, not just your own desires. That's not, you know, not just use that as, oh, he never said not, so I didn't do it. That's not to be lazy, no. But that's just to learn to do things in his time, because he's got the perfect time, hasn't he? The Sabbath, I think the Sabbath we overlook sometimes just how amazingly important it is. First thing the most is, <laughs> when he comes down, I'm like, Sabbath. I can just imagine all the people that come, he's been gone for ages again, and he comes down and he hits us with the Sabbath straight away. Must be important, the Sabbath, wasn't it? It must be. They probably got it, we should get it. Now, he didn't bless the seventh day and make it holy for himself, okay? He blessed it and made it holy for us to enjoy it with him. It's about resting in and deepening our relationship with him, okay? And it's about reconnecting with our individual and collective identities and destinies. Beautiful self. It's given as a gift to us. Yeshua told us in Mark 2 27, he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Yeah, have this. I've made this for you. Jehovah wants to bring his people back together as a community. The picture we've got here is that they're all in the tents and everything. But this is this is true today. He wants to bring people back together as a community. The Shabbat is the starting place for finding you, unity in Him. The tabernacle is a picture of unity in Messiah, but the Shabbat is where we begin. I think that's important. 
now. Why does he do it now? But think about the people, okay? The people are trembling. This is poached golden calf. Their future hangs in the balance. They don't actually know what he's going to come down and say. He might come down and say, the Lord says you will all die by sundown tonight. You know, they don't know, do they? All they know is they faffed up really big time. But <clears throat> he speaks to them now about the Shabbat. Why? Could it possibly be that the Shabbat is the primary and most important outward sign of our covenant? Could it be that? It does get mentioned a lot and at very, very important points in time, doesn't it? The most important thing that we can do on the Shabbat is to stop what we were doing in the six days and just receive the blessing and just Shema, which means to treasure, cherish and carefully guard the holiness of the beautiful island in time that he's prepared for us. That's what we're to do on the Sabbath. It's to be enjoyed, it's a gift. I do honestly think it's, it's like every week the Lord sends us an invite, a beautiful invitation. Come and be with me. Wow. Oh, he's inviting me to be with me. Now, <clears throat> let's talk about they're all a little bit freaked out. It's all hanging in the balance. But there's good news, isn't it? Because Moshe will in this week's passage is bringing them into full awareness of the brilliant news that is this. Their teshuva, which is repentance, which is turning to him again, has touched the heart of their betrothed. Right, I mean, never forget this relationship is like a love story. Yeah, never forget our relationship with the Lord. It's a love story. Okay, the forgiven. He's forgiven his adulterous. Oh, can you imagine how he must have felt. The relationship is restored, and they have another chance to be who he created and called them to be. What grace! Don't tell me that grace is a new thing. What grace was this? This is beautiful, isn't it? I bet they all jump for joy like these young ladies on the picture. Now, do you remember the purpose of the tabernacle? <clears throat> Exodus 25, 8. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. And it's still the same in the future. Revelation 21, 3 says, And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of Elohim is with men, and he will dwell with them. They shall be his people. Elohim himself will be with them, and be their Elohim. Now, Keep in mind this whole picture of the fact that this is a love story that's going on. He intends to have an intimate relationship with his people. He desires us to want that relationship as much as he does. We can't even comprehend how much he loves us. He just wants it reciprocated. He wants us to want him. Now our desire, what does it do? It moves us towards maturity because he's waiting for his bride to be holy and that's set apart for him. Now, we're going to walk through the tabernacle. There's a lot of scripture that we could be looking at. I just want to walk through it quickly in case there's people who don't know what this tabernacle and building is all about. We begin at the door, <coughs> the outer entrance. Um, Yeshua, by the way, says, I am the door. This is all pictures of Messiah in this tabernacle. <coughs> then we enter into the courtyard where we encounter the brazen altar. Okay? Without the altar and the death that it represents, no one could come into the presence of Jehovah. It is the place of judgment and we can continue on because of the sacrifice Yeshua has made for us there. So we move on. The next, time, next move we make is to the labor of water. We know the washing by the water of the word matures us and allows us to wear those clean spotless garments. We walk through the first veil as priests of the Most High for the purpose of service. Notice that every time before they entered in, they'd wash in this laver, okay, which is representative of the Word, because it says in Ephesians 5, it says we're washed in the water of the Word. Interestingly, the word laver in the Hebrew is this word, which you can't pronounce, kiowa. And that's not like a Japanese word, but it actually means to purify. And it's also the word for fairness. And if you think of the refiner's fairness, it purifies, doesn't it? We're to be purified by constantly looking in the word. And Mel asked me the other day, why is it made of women's looking glasses? Which in mirrors. I never knew that till I was in my twenties. Lots of looking glass. I thought it was some weird, wonderful thing. It's a mirror, isn't it? But it was made of all these mirrors. And it's symbolic that because it tells us in James that we're to look in the word. And when we do, we see truly what we look like. And we see 
Oh no, look at this thing. He was, he was able to walk around, can't you, thinking you look great. I saw a fellow in the cafe the other day and he was holding court with these two ladies. And he's one of these fellas, he's just a bit unfortunate. He's got his dog and it's like his dog's his life because he must be lonely. And there he is, he's got this chance to impress these two ladies. And he's sitting there and he's talking. And he's got a big piece of bread stuck to his face. And, he's, and I was just thought, this is me. I wanted to go over and flick it off his face, but then I thought, that would make it worse, wouldn't it? But we do go around, don't we, with big bits of stuff on us, and we think we're dead, doing dead well and we're dead killed, but no. Look in the Word and see for yourself what you truly look like. Now, <clears throat> the priests, that's what they would do. They would look in this labour and they'd go, oh no. And they'd make sure they were spotless and they were clean. Now, we move on into the next and it's the table of showbread was on the right it had 12 loaves of bread symbolizing the unity of the 12 tribes of Israel and the Messiah who was the word, the bread it was our manna a little verse here just so we remember we've moved in now we're supposed to be priests of the most high God here's, here's what we're supposed to be like Ezekiel 44, 23-24 and they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and profane and cause them to descend between the unclean and the clean and in controversy they shall stand in judgment and they shall judge it according to my judgment and they shall keep my laws and my statutes in all my assemblies and they shall hallow my sabbaths these are the people that the Lord is looking for now we're still in the holy place we've got the light of the menorah which floods this room symbolizing the shining light of the Torah we step up to the altar of incense where we are able to pray knowledgeably having partaking of the bread and having the light of the menorah to guide us in our prayers. Okay? Now, we're very close to what's known as the Holy of Holies. And there's only a veil that separates us. We all know that behind that is the Ark of the Covenant, yeah? Now, the Gospel accounts <coughs> says that the veil was torn. However, there was two veils in the temple. According to Alfred Edeshine, in his book, The Temple, the first entrance into the holy place was two leaf doors with a gold plating and covered by a rich Babylonian curtain of the four colours of the temple which is fine linen, blue, scarlet and purple now Edishin also writes that a wooden partition separated the most holy from the holy place and um, over the door hung a veil so which veil was torn? you to ask yourself this so let's have a look at some verses in the Hebrews the NIV of Hebrews 10 19 onwards says this therefore brothers since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Yeshua so that's telling us that oh this translation is saying oh we're all right we can go into the holy of holies here okay the word in Greek that's used is hagios and according to the translation it does seem clear doesn't it that we can go into the most holy place the holy of holies so hang on a minute let's see how the same Greek word is used in other verses Hebrews 9 2-3 says for the tabernacle was prepared the first part in which was the lampstand the table and the showbread we know which bit this is this is the bit where the um, this is the holy place which is called the sanctuary and the word used here is hagios okay so when it uses the word hagios it's actually talking about the holy place not the holy of holies then it says, and behind the second veil, part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. Now when it wants to talk about the holy of holies, in the Greek, I didn't know this before, what it actually does is, it says, hagios, hagios. It repeats the word twice. So we now know there's a difference. Okay, so hagios refers to the holy area where the menorah and the table of showbread are, in verse 2. And in verse 3, hagios is repeated in order to point to the holy of holies. So it was the first, the first veil, this Babylonian curtain, not the veil separating the holy place from the holy of holies that was torn. When Yeshua died, it opened the way for us to come in and serve as priests. Yeshua, however, will enter the holy of holies as our high priest and king on the day of atonement. Now, we see the entrance to the holy of holies open in Revelation, um, when the time has come for judgment and rewards. And let's have a little read. It says, and the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that thou should give us reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, 
and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. There's the entrance to the Holy of Holies being opened. Revelation 15, 5 to 8, it says, And after that I looked, behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. The seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts gathered with golden girdles. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God who lived forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. That's going to be something else. <laughs> now, the temple veils themselves. This is nuts. It was 60 feet long and 30 feet wide. The thickness of a man's palm, right? They were wrought in 72 squares and they were so heavy that we're told that 300 priests were needed to manipulate each one. That's a big game, isn't it? Now the veil being rent from the top to bottom was such a terrible portent because it indicated that God's own hand had torn it in two. This wasn't just going to happen, was it? Further an indication that it was the outer or first veil that was rent. <coughs> now we've got a little clip here it's from the Jewish Talmud in Yoma 39b of the events which occurred in 30 AD. It says this, 40 years before the temple was destroyed, uh, the gate of the Hekel, which is the holy place, as opposed to the Holy of Holies, opened by themselves. For the huge doors of the temple behind the veil to open of their own court, or in association with the great earthquake, would cause them to pull powerfully against the veil, and with the lintel falling at the same time, this could have torn it in two. So even the historical evidence points to the fact that it was the outer veil that was torn in two. And we hear that we that every night the doors used to fly open. These doors took 30 men to move. Yeah, but do you ever think, didn't they get their heads around it and go, you know what, something's going on here. It went dark the day that this man, they call the King of the Jews, died. It was an earthquake, and ever since then, these doors keep flying open of a night. That veil that took 300 men to manhandle, tore in two. This is the thing, isn't it? This is, a, this is spiritual blindness. We are so blessed that the Lord is on our eyes. Sometimes I think we forget it. And there's so many people throughout history and you think, why didn't they get it? Why didn't they get it? And why do I get it? Because the Lord's opened our eyes and we have to be very grateful for that. So what does the construction of the tabernacle have to do with the Sabbath? If you want to know what not to do on the Sabbath, then look to all the different types of work done in constructing the tabernacle for clues. Now we know that the Sabbath is all about creation, which is <clears throat> like the resting or the letting go. This is something to, you know, resting and letting go is an important part of the creation process, isn't it? If you'd imagine a painter who just carried on painting, it would be garbage, wouldn't it? He has to know when to stop and to let it go. Now, let's have a look at the universe. <clears throat> Jehovah carved out of space in his world that wasn't him. Okay, that's not strictly true, but it's a way of looking at it. He did it for love. Some sages liken the creation, that's the universe, um, to a womb. In that, like a womb, it isn't there for you, it's there for someone else. Yeah? A woman's womb is there to support life for the child, it's not there for supporting her own life. Just like the universe is there to support life for us. Okay, Jehovah wanted someone with free will to have a relationship with, but that creature, man, needed his own environment, so Jehovah went about creating it. This environment has its own special laws, known as the laws of physics, yeah? Now remember, Jehovah is outside of time and space. This isn't a place, you know, that fits in with his way of doing things. It says in Genesis 1.27, so God created man in his own image. The being Jehovah created had the ability to create too. And I know we can procreate, but we also have the ability to create our own environment. So man, this is what happens, man looks at his everything and says, I'm going to carve out a little section of this for the one that I love, just as the Lord produced the universe and creation for the one that he loves as us. 
It will involve special laws that have nothing to do with me, but everything to do with God. I will obey those laws in order to create a space that works for God. These are laws of purity, impurity, laws of holy and profane. We observe these laws because we want this space to work for Jehovah, just as he observes the laws of physics to make our space work for us. So just as we are about to recreate or create the Mishkan, Jehovah lets us in on the secret, and the secret is rest. Sabbath is rest from Macha, which is a Hebrew word, and it means tampering with your environment, which is what we do for all week, isn't it? So who builds the tabernacle? His name is Bezalel, right? And his name is shorthand for in the image of God. Isn't that insane? Bezalel is God-like in that he creates the environment for the one he loves. He loves God. Just as God created the universe for the one that he loves, which is us. Now the danger is this. This will go on move on to the Temple of Solomon. Men built the magnificent Temple of Solomon and they thought they'd done Jehovah a favour. They forgot all about his character and the things that he's really interested in. He's not impressed by the things that impress us. If we want Jehovah to dwell amongst us, then we must be obedient and not stiff-necked. Acts 7, 47 to 51 says this, but Solomon built him a house and apparently it was amazing. Albeit the most high dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house will you build me, saith the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Hath not my hand made all these things? You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did. So did you. This is the point at which Stephen then gets stoned. And he's pointing out to these people, you think you've done this amazing thing and it's, it's got to impress the Lord. You think he needed you to build him a house like this? So have you got it all wrong? Everything is his. Please get your head around it. What the Lord's looking for is to inhabit a place and dwell amongst the people who obey him, who are not stiff-necked, uncircumcised in heart and ears. People who don't resist him. That's what the Lord's looking for. And you get an idea of this as well in 1 Samuel 15. Samuel said, Hath Jehovah as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of Jehovah? He holds to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of Jehovah, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Bear all this in mind when you read the next scripture. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwelleth in you. The Lord is looking for a holy people so he can inhabit them people. You know it says in the scriptures that the Holy Spirit is given to those who obey. The Lord's looking for the deeds, people who follow things according to his word. And we'll see what happens when you do at the end of the Torah portion. Now I'm just going to move very quickly before the break. Moshe spoke unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which Jehovah commanded, saying, Take ye from among you an offering unto Jehovah, whoever is of a willing heart. Now there's a question in it. Let him bring in an offering of the Lord, gold and silver and brass. Okay, now it's religion and man conceived, man focused ministries that have to be slow sold with slick marketing programs, clever emotional manipulation, <laughs> flattery and guilt trips. That poster there, by the way, is hilarious. It says, the American Christian will prosperity gospel ribbon fish. It says, get yours free with a donation of only $22. <laughs> How does that work? I don't understand. Please note that Moshe didn't have to do a second's worth of selling, threatening, begging or convincing. He didn't have to manipulate the people's emotional heartstrings, did he? Now, the very root of the Hebrew word truma, often translated into English as offering, means to raise high or lift up. So think of this when you give your offerings. According to Rashi, the word truma or offering implies a process of separating out a portion of one's resources from the rest for a higher, more lofty purpose than consumption or investment. And it says in verse 6, And blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair, and ram sky skins dyed red, and badger skins and shatim wood, and oil for the light and spices for anointing oil and for the sweet incense, and onyx stones and stones to be set for the ephod and for the breastplate. Now, the collection of these materials was a monumental task, but the people had caught the vision, and they absolutely delighted in the efforts. They came alive with a sense of purpose and destiny. And it says, and every wise-hearted among you shall come. Wise-hearted, okay? 
and may the poor the Lord has commanded. The tabernacle, his tent and his coverings, his tashes, his boards, his bars, his pillars and his sockets. The ark and the stage thereof with the mercy seat and the veil of the covering. The table and his stage and all his vessels and the showbread. The candlestick also for the light in his furniture and his lamps with the oil for the light. And the incense altar and his stage and the anointing oil and the sweet incense and the hanging for the door at the entering in of the tabernacle. The altar of burnt offering with his brazen gate, great, his stage and all his vessels, the labour in his foot. The hangings of the court, his pillars and their sockets and the hanging for the door of the court. The pins of the tabernacle and the pins of the court and their cords. This is a big undertaking. Isn't it? The cloths of service to do service in the holy place. The holy garments for Adam the priest and the garments of his sons to minister in the priest's office. All the congregation of the children of Israel departed from the presence of Moshe. And they came, every one whose heart stirred him up, and every one with whom his spirit made willing. And they brought to the Lord's offering, to the work of the tabernacle of the congregation, and for all his service, and for all the holy garments. So he doesn't need your gold, or your silver, or your hard-earned money, or anything else that you might possess, or have the ability to acquire. He wants you to catch his vision for the earth, and he wants what he really wants is your heart. Hence Jehovah's word to us as always, whosoever is of a willing heart, let him bring in a true man. And there is a picture of the Polish crown jewels. I didn't even know Poland had crown jewels, but there they are, on the wall. <laughs> so if you're ever in Poland, you can mention that you've seen them. <clears throat> right, like I said before, this is the sweetest time. It's, it's, I put down like it's all a bit mills and boom. Now, it's the interval in time which the rest of the book of Exodus will cover is a very special, uniquely blessed final four and a half months of the first year of the life of the redeemed people from Egypt. This period extends from approximately the time of the Feast of Tabernacles in the seventh month up to and including the new moon of the month of Nisan, which is known as New Year's Day in the Hebrew calendar. Now, <clears throat> this is how the Lord remembers this particular time period. Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith Jehovah, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals, when thou wentest after me in the wilderness, in the land that was not sown. Israel was holiness unto Jehovah, and the first fruits of his increase. All that devouring shall offend, evil shall come upon them, saith Jehovah. The Lord looks back at this time and goes, Oh, it was brilliant. We were so in love, it was fabulous. Now over the course of the four and a half months in question, the people worked together to build a scale model of the heavenly Mishkan Jehovah showed to Moshe on Mount Sinai. They'll build it exactly as Jehovah's instructed, and nobody moans. Now, if you've read the rest of the Torah, you'll realise that that's quite a big deal. Nobody moans. Back in Parsha Truma, Jehovah charged Moshe, he said, according to all that I teach you, make the tabernacle and make all its furnishings following the plan that I'm showing you. Two whole parshas later, nine old chapters, it's still not built. The only things they've built is the golden calf and the altar for the idolatrous sacrifices. He broke the covenant in a grievous way. Three thousand are dead. It was the massacre of the golden calf worshippers. So the rest of them who are alive and remain have learned some stunning and wonderful things about the personality and nature of the God of Abraham, Yitzhak and Yaakov, which few people who have not sinned grievously and have been forgiven much, could never comprehend or appreciate. With them, we have learned that the God of Abraham, Yitzhak and Jacob is a compassionate, loving, covenant, faithful, sin-cleansing and life-restoring God. It says now, they came, both men and women, as many as were willing hearted, and broke bracelets and earrings and rings and tablets, all Jews of gold and every man that had offered offered an offering of gold unto the Lord, and every man with whom was found blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen, goat's hair and red skins of rams and badger skins brought them. Every one that did offer an offering of silver and brass brought the Lord's offering, and every man with whom was found shittim wood for any work of the service brought it. Now, if you've ever spent years in bondage, I did, to sin and drink and nonsense and gibberish, and then he set gloriously free in an instant. Perhaps you can understand. If you've ever sinned so grievously that you deserve death and you've not only been graciously spared but also gloriously forgiven, restored, perhaps you can understand their attitude. These people hadn't been wealthy in Egypt, they were slaves. The only wealth that they'd ever known had been showered on them by the Egyptians. 
in the night of the Exodus. And just think about it, this is the first time you've had a new valley. You probably planned for this to be their nest egg for starting their new lives in the promised land. And yet they gave. It says, And all the women that were wise hearted did spin with their hands and brought that which they had spun, both of blue and of purple and of scarlet and of fine linen. And all the women whose hearts stirred them up in wisdom spun goat's hair. Imagine them all busy, 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 busy. Fight, Mike. <laughs> so is she. I'm gonna I'm gonna make a flag. He says, they were willing workers engaged in nothing short of a labour of love. The rulers brought onyx stones and stones to be set for the ephod and for the breastplate, and spice and oil for the light and for the anointing oil and for the sweet incense. The children of Israel brought a willing offering unto the Lord, every man and woman whose heart made them willing to bring for all manner of work which the Lord had commanded to be made by the hand of motion. I would finish here. This suggests not everyone was willing Imagine the ones who didn't give and imagine how they feel right now or when they stood before you over anyway. Imagine that. They didn't give. At the end of their lives did they think, I'm glad I never give. <laughs> they gave up the chance to help build the tabernacle of Jehovah for approximately seventy pounds a household. Glad I'm glad I never give. <laughs> I Me mean, people, how did they get on it? I don't understand it. They missed out on that opportunity. For the sake of 70 pounds, and there's a golf tip, which is a clue for us to have a little break. <laughs> Should we continue on? We've got, um, oh, yeah. Moshe said unto the children of Israel, See that Yehoda has called um, by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of her, the tribe of Judah. And he hath filled him with the Spirit of God. Oh, filled with the Spirit of God, eh? All that years ago. <laughs> okay. In wisdom, in understanding, and in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship, to devise curious works, to work in gold and in silver and in brass, and in cotton of stones, to set them, and in carving of wood, to make any manner of cunning work. Okay. So, Bezalel, which his name actually means in the shadow of El, which is Elohim, which is God. Uh, is the son of, which means he has the same characteristics of Yuri, which is my light, and his dad was called Her, which is white, and he's from the tribe of Judah, which speaks of praise. So, <clears throat> Bezalel's name, which means in the shadow of El, is a description of one who was covered by the shadow of the Almighty. And throughout the scriptures, living in the shadow of Elohim is the best place to be. Psalm 63, 7 says, Because you have been my help, therefore in the shadow of your wings will I rejoice. Psalm 91, 1-4 says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of Jehovah, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I will trust. Surely He shall deliver me from the snare of the fowler, from the noise and pestilence. He shall cover thee with His feathers, and under His wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. So, our safety is under the shadow of his wings, covered by his feathers. Where does this bird in the tree come from? Where does it originate? Well, Genesis 1 to 2 says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the spirit of Elohim was hovering over the face of the waters. Deuteronomy 32 11 says, As an eagle stares up its nest, this is the Lord speaking, I always look after his people. As an eagle stares up its nest, hovers over its young, spreading out its wing, uh, wings, taking them up, carrying them on its wings. Now, the hovering is done by the Spirit in one of the most well-known stories of the Scriptures, where Miriam or Mary is overshadowed by the Spirit of the Almighty. Luke 1.35 The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Highest will overshadow, overshadow you. Therefore also, the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. So, <clears throat> we see this thing is a good place to be, is in the shadow of the Almighty. <laughs> a very good place to be. It's when the Spirit of God is upon you as well. You're overfilled by the Leo with the Spirit, and in Isaiah we see a similar filling of the Spirit upon Messiah. Isaiah 11 1. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of Jehovah shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of Jehovah. 
So both Messiah and Bezalel brought together the spiritual and physical worlds. The presence of the Spirit is what endowed Bezalel with wisdom, understanding, knowledge, and all manner of workmanship. Now, if we go back to verse 31, it says, And he hath filled him with the Spirit of God, in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship. Okay, where, where do we see this workmanship again? If we're going to see Bezalel as like a messianic type figure. Ephesians 2, 8 to 10 says, For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So where is Yeshua, the Messiah's workmanship? And not only are we individual tabernacles, but we're also being built into one united spiritual house, which is a picture of the tabernacle. 1 Peter 2, 5 says, You also as living stones, that's us, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to our Adonai through Messiah Yeshua. Bezalel is a prophetic picture of the Messiah, who in the end is going to build a heavenly tabernacle as pictured in Revelation. In Revelation it says this, And I, John, saw the holy city New Jerusalem coming down from out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. Now, this is the ultimate desire of the Almighty, that he might once again dwell among his people, that Messiah may live with his purified bride. Okay, and we get this right from the very beginning of Scripture. The first word of Scripture is Bereshit, meaning in the beginning. And if you take a look, you'll see that the first Hebrew letter is enlarged. Big. This enlarged letter is found in all the ancient scrolls. And an irregularity in the Hebrew has an extra teaching that goes with it. And this teaching is something that never comes across in the English translation. So, it's there for a reason, this big, massive letter is there for a reason okay <clears throat> and here's some early depictions of our, and here's how it looks today when you see it written the bet was a picture of a house or a tent or even a family we see the concept of the family in the common hebrew phrase the house of jacob the enlarged bet in genesis 1 1 tells the story of the rest of the scripture jehovah's desire is for a house a family to have a family the groom must have a bride and that's what he's coming back for. And that's what we prepared ourselves as, as his bride. I told you before, it's a love story. This is a love story. Now we go back to verse 31. It says, He filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, in understanding, and in knowledge, and in all manner of workmanship. Okay? So, wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. There's an analogy. You can see a demonstration. Where knowledge was pictured as water. The water was poured into a glass, which was understanding. First there was a little bit of water was poured in, then a lot more. Now we're like that glass and we take in the knowledge as we can, as our understanding allows us. Then when the water filled the glass, it was handed off to a needy person. That's wisdom, because you're using what's in the glass for its intended use. Okay, imagine more water or more knowledge is being poured into the glass than what it could handle. The water spills over the sides and makes a big mess. And that's what happens when all we do is take in knowledge. Taking in knowledge should be more than just filling your brain. It needs to be acted on as was intended. And that takes wisdom. We study the scriptures, we study the Torah, don't we? Not just so we learn stuff. Oh, I know loads of things now. So that we can apply it. Okay? Torah knowledge is like building materials. If it's only kept in your brains, it's only an imaginary structure. Remember, we're told to assar, to do, to build with his words. Understanding is the ability to see the purpose and meaning beyond Torah knowledge that we have. And wisdom puts knowledge and understanding to work with the proper heart attitude and exactly according to Jehovah's plan. Proverbs 9 10 says this, the fear of Jehovah is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of Jehovah is understanding. The fear of Jehovah leads to wisdom. Now, knowing Yeshua is understanding. Knowing about Yeshua is only empty knowledge. And that's just water that's going to spill out of your glass. There's a difference, isn't it? It says, And he hath put in his heart that he may teach both he and Ahoyab, the son of 
Ahishamak of the tribe of Dan. Now, Ahoyav, his name means the father's tent. He's of the tribe of Dan, which speaks of judgment. And Ahishamak, his name means my brother is close. So what we've got is Bezalel, which means in the shadow of El, God. And Aholiaf, the father's tent, where the builders set up to do the work of the tabernacle. That's bizarre, isn't it? <laughs> it's almost like it was planned. <laughs> the shadow of the Almighty and the father's tent are going to build what? The tabernacle. Cool. We know that Bezalel is from the tribe of Judah, which speaks of praise. And Aholiaf is from Dan, which speaks of judgment. Therefore, you can see that it's both judgment and praise that would build the tabernacle. Now, not only would they see the spiritual implications through the understanding given to them of each item to be made, but they would teach this knowledge to those who had hearts to help. Okay, guess what? Bezalel's great granddad was Caleb. We talked about him last week, didn't we? I love Caleb. <laughs> that was his great granddad. So, what a big hurrah there, I'm thinking. Now, the tabernacle was built by those <coughs> given knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. Today, that assembly of people which is symbolized by the tabernacle, remember, we are living stones being built into this tabernacle. So today, that assembly of people, which is us, symbolized by the tabernacle, is once again being restored and built up, isn't it? And it's our job to participate in the building process by receiving knowledge and acting on it with understanding and wisdom. And in simple terms, that means being obedient to what the Spirit reveals to us from His Word, with Messiah as our King leader, and we can be a part of the restoration of His tabernacle. That's why it's that. Now, Bezalel was given the ability to instruct others, and the word we are looking at here is Lahoo. This word is the same root, Yara, as teacher, which is Moray, and instruction, which is Torah. Okay, so therefore, what Jehovah had put in the mind of Bezalel was the ability to teach and instruct the Torah. That's nuts, isn't it? Now, he was able to take his knowledge, understanding, and wisdom and use those gifts to empower others. He wasn't just saying, do this, do that, and do it. He was explaining why he would do it. And that's what people who teach Torah are supposed to do. This is why you're supposed to do this, and this is why you're supposed to do that. So he empowered others. And while he was teaching others to cover acacia wood with gold, so can set stones in gold, sentence, make linens and oil and incense, he was also helping them to understand why these special instructions were necessary to make a building that was holy enough for Jehovah, Jehovah to dwell in. Now, this is just a bit of number crunching nonsense, but I just thought it was funny enough. And then, well, it, there might be something to it, it's just bizarre. Right, not only do Hebrew letters have a pictographic meaning, but they each have a numerical value. I don't know whether you knew that. Right, now the name Bezalel, <coughs> he is the builder of the house, and his name has a numerical value which is 153. Right, the house he's the builder of is a picture of the body or the sons of God. The phrase the sons of God has the numerical value of 153. Yeshua tells his disciples who are going to build his kingdom that they will be fishers of men and we get the number 153 again. Where do we get that? John 21 11 Simon Peter went up and drank the net to land full of large fish 153 and although there were so many the net was not broken you got to ask why is that detail in the scripture? It's just bizarre isn't it? So there's another one as well. Imagine being the man that made the Ark of the Covenant. This Bezalel. Imagine being it. That's just nuts, isn't it? Somebody actually did it. And it was this brother. I wonder what his mum told him. Oh, Bezalel, he's making the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> she must have been made up, wasn't she? <laughs> and his dad showing off again, is he? <laughs> Now, Bezazir and Ahaliah were not chosen because they were skilled craftsmen. They were skilled craftsmen because they were chosen. That's important, isn't it? So don't be sitting there and I couldn't do anything that I can't do. I can I am power. They were skilled because they were chosen. They've all been chosen. For the purpose, the Lord has a purpose for you. To build his tabernacle. What's he looking for? Willing hearts. Okay, verse 36, this. 
Then wrote Bezalel and Ahuliath, and every wise hearted man in whom the Lord put wisdom and understanding to know how to work all manner of work for the service of the sanctuary, according to all that the Lord had commanded. And Moses called Bezalel and Ahuliath, and every wise hearted man in whose heart the Lord had put wisdom, even everyone whose heart had stirred him up. Do you get that? Your heart stirred him up to come unto the way to do it. And they received of Moshe all the offering which the children of Israel had brought for the work of the service of the sanctuary to make it with all. And they brought yet unto him free offerings every morning, every morning, go on, give them, give them all. And all the wise men that brought all the work of the sanctuary came, every man from his work which they made. And they spake unto Moshe, saying, The people bring much more than enough for the service of the work which the Lord commanded to make. This is much. Moshe gave a commandment, and they caused it to be proclaimed throughout the camp, saying, let neither man nor woman make any more work for the offering of the sanctuary. So the people were restrained from bringing. That's what the people were like. They just, stop! Stop bringing! They've got enough! It's insane, isn't it? You see, now it's considered to be the Mills and Boone swimming period. They're just, the heart, their hearts were just, oh, oh, we just want to give, we want to be a part of this, we love you, God. And you can, but you know, this is on the back of the golden calf and incidents when they realized this God of ours has forgiven us, he's given us a chance. Verse 7 says, For the stuff they had was sufficient for all the work to make it and too much. And every wise hearted man and woman that brought the work of the tabernacle made ten curtains of fine twined linen and blue, and purple and scarlet with cherubims of cunning work he made them. So the people wanted Jehovah to dwell amongst them so much that they couldn't help themselves but give. It cost them, but they did it anyway. Now, this is nuts. The red dye. <laughs> the red, this freaked me out, this. The red dye, remember red is the colour of the sacrifice, yeah. Blue is supposed to be the colour of obedience. And the mixture of the two, purple, is the colour of royalty. It was supposed to be a royal priesthood. So, that's talking about sacrifice and obedience. Okay, and the white speaks of righteousness. Now, there's a messianic prophecy which is all linked in with red dye, red dye. Because they had to dye things red, didn't they, for the priest garments and for the tabernacle. Okay, and this is a bizarre thing, but in Psalm 22, 6 to 8, this is messianic, and it says this, But I am aware, and no man, a reproach of men, a despiser of the people. This is the Messiah speaking. All they that see me laugh me to scorn, they shoot out the lip, they shake their head, saying, He trusted on Jehovah that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. Right, I am aware. Okay, what's all this about? The way of where I'm referred to in our text is unique in scripture. In the Hebrew, it is a particular female where, which is called the crimson where. And it's not until you begin to study the characteristics and the life cycle of the crimson or scarlet worm that you begin to see the tremendous truth revealed by the scripture. Right? <clears throat> and I've got some quotes there because I was like, this isn't real. This is not real. <laughs> I'm looking. It's actually probably the insect known as the Cocos delicious. Okay, and there's reference to, to it in um, the scripture that we've just read, 36.8. And in Jonah, there's a reference to it. And there's a picture of a man who has taken one of these worms and used it as a dye. You can see the colour on his hand. Yep. Now, this, this crimson worm, climbs on the tree all by itself. Okay? This worm has got a bizarre life. Nobody forces it to get on the tree. It willingly searches out the cairns oak. Then, by its own choice, it climbs on the tree. Okay? First point of reference. Please understand that nobody forced Yeshua on the cross. What he did was of his own choice. He could have called all the angels of heaven to release him, but he died alone for us, yeah? The crimson worm knows when it climbs on the tree that it will not come back down alive. It's going to the tree to birth a family, okay? And to do that, it must die. This is just nuts. Yeshua, knowing all things, was still willing to die on the cross to birth a family. Okay. Once on the tree, the crimson worm then attaches itself to the tree. It makes sure it is secure because the body of the worm will eventually be the shelter for the young which are born. Remember that it wasn't the nails that held our Saviour to the cross. It was love. 
Okay. The worm will then lay its eggs and shelter them under her body. During the birthing process, she secretes a crimson fluid or gel. The scarlet fluid covers her entire body and all the eggs she lays. It also leaves a stain on the tree which will never fade with the passing of time. The blood of Yeshua stained him, the cross and all of us which he redeemed. The blood doesn't lose its power. After dying to birth the family, something amazing takes place. For a period of three days, the worm can be scraped from the tree and the crimson gel can be used to make a dye. That dye was the same which was used in the tabernacle in the garments of the high priest. On the morning of the fourth day, however, the worm has pulled the head and tail together and is now in the shape of a heart on the tree. But it's no longer crimson, it is now a wax which is white as snow. It's not eh? <clears throat> The crimson worm actually is bizarre as well, it's also very fragrant when it's crushed. You think of the sacrifice that Yeshua made in that blazing, that was the fragrant smell. Okay, and it can be used as medicine. It's just nonsense. It's like, wow. But his stripes were healed now. Jehovah created the crimson worm in exactly this way for a reason. And there's a tree stained by a crimson worm. Isn't that just insane? <laughs> it's just getting, I can't believe you, Lord. It's just getting more ridiculous every day. Oh, yeah, it's just, I don't get me around this. But there you go. Blown away by it, where? <laughs> <laughs> That's a tiny bit, isn't it? Okay. <clears throat> now, we're going to go into a bit of detail here. There's all kinds of bits in the scripture that we're reading here, which you could probably read and go, yeah, yeah, five this and five that, and then they put the coupling on, and then was a brass thing there, and they did that, and oh, yeah, all right. Oh, well, how many bits have we got left? Oh, yeah. So I've just took a section of it and shown you that actually in the detail there's some powerful messages being spoken. So we just want to look at these next few verses and I will break it down a little bit. Just, I know because we all do it, we will probably read these bits and go When's somebody going to do something? Well let's just break it down. The length of one curtain was 28 cubits and the breadth of one curtain 4 cubits. The curtains were all of one size. So I can hear you do it. And he coupled the five curtains one onto another, and the other five curtains he coupled one onto another. Make note of the things that are bolded. Coupled five curtains, and he made loops of blue on the edge of one curtain from the silver edge in the coupling. Likewise, he made in the uttermost side of another curtain in the coupling of the second. Fifty loops, fifty loops, made in one curtain, and fifty loops maybe in the edge of the curtain, which was in the coupling of the second. The loops held one curtain to another. He made fifty tashes of gold gold, and he coupled the curtains one onto another with the tashes, so it became one tabernacle. That's a lot of that. Well, there's a little bit of a breakdown. There were ten curtains to be made of fine linen, okay? Five curtains were to be coupled together to form one curtain, then the other five curtains will also coupled together to form one curtain. Okay? And each set of five is to be coupled together to make one curtain. Okay? The Hebrew word coupled is the Hebrew word shavar. Okay? Now, this is a picture of what we're looking at. So you've got five curtains here, all get joined to make one curtain. Five there, all get joined to make one curtain. So we end up with a big, big, big like that and then it goes over the tabernacle and it looks like this okay but why all the details why this and that and tashes and thing wow okay well for the start use of the word shiva when it says couple them together let's have a look at some of the uses of it in scripture judges 20 verse 11 says so all the men of israel were gathered against the city knit together as one man ah so this word for coupling is knit together in this scripture. Psalm 94 20. Shall the throne of iniquity have fellowship with thee which frameth mischief by law? It's this word coupling again, but this time it's fellowship. So the word Jehovah chooses speaks of oneness in fellowship. Okay? These curtains are coupled together. Hang on, in what way? Of oneness of fellowship. Yeah? Now, 
that's in the five cans, but in the ten cans as they come together as a whole as well. Right, why the number five? What's going on? What's happening? It seems to be connected with God's grace, with faith and with life. Okay? The fifth letter in the Hebrew in the alphabet is called the He. Yeah, the letter He is placed as an example of in both the names of Avram, Avram sorry, and Sarai sometime after their obedient response, which ends up giving them their meaning and their purpose. So this fifth letter, okay, what's it speaking of? We're saved by grace, yeah, through faith. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the word. It comes by revelation. Now the letter A, with the numerical value of five, is a symbol of something being revealed. Okay? Now, this thing with Genetra and all these things, you know, like we did before, the numbers and all this, and all the numbers are. Looking into numerical values of words can be very dangerous, and it can lead to serious error, because people go nuts with it. Okay, try to make connections that just aren't there to validate teachings that are nothing to do with Jehovah's words of life. You see this in the teachings of the Kabbalah and stuff. Okay, now certain numbers in scriptures do seem to have significance, but we can't go looking for that which isn't there, can we? Okay, so when I think of the number five, I think of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. That's the five that Jehovah's people need to concern themselves with the five books of the Torah. But that said, the Hebrew word for fire is shamash, and that means to prepare and to be ready. Now grace prepares you for the Torah, Torah prepares you for life, doesn't it? So Jehovah's building his temple, his people rather, into a holy temple, where the fine twine linen speaks of his righteousness. The number five speaks of his grace through faith by revelation, and it speaks of being prepared. Torah. Yeah. Hebrews 3, 5 to 6 says this, and Moshe verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for the testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we? The house he's building is us. <laughs> this tabernacle is a picture of what he's building and it's us. Whose house are we? If we hold fast the confidence and the reducing of the hope firm unto the end. Okay, now the two curtains represent the two houses, the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Now remember that each curtain is five curtains coupled together, right? What does coupling talk of? It talks of oneness in fellowship. So, the Lord's people, which happen to be in two houses, the house of Israel and the house of Judah, these houses should be coupled together by oneness of fellowship. The Lord's teaching us something there. <laughs> Think of what? Get your heads around this. John 13, 35 says this. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another, coupled together. That's how people are going to recognize us. This is the house he's building. People who have love one to another. Hebrews 10, 25. Not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the matter of sons, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching, looking out for each other, watching each other's backs. Oh, you want to go? Oh, come on, yeah. I'm encouraging each other. Oneness of fellowship. Deuteronomy 7 6, for thou art an holy people unto Jehovah thy God. Jehovah thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. What privilege. Wow. Now, when you look at people in this room, you bear in mind that. When you look at them, you're seeing people who are special people. Special people above all the people that are on the face of the earth. Now Romans 12, 10 says, Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love, in honour preferring one another. This is the fellowship. This is what binds us together like these curtains are bound. Ephesians 4, 2 says, With all loneliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. That suggested that this song wasn't going to be a right pain. <laughs> so it's telling us, with patience, for better or other, in love. Because that's how the Lord wanted to be. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Isn't that beautiful? That's what we're to be like to each other. This is all the picture that's in the tabernacle itself. 
Hebrews 13, 3, exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. 1 Peter 3, 8, finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful and be courteous. Coupled together, oneness in fellowship. This is what it looks like, this is what the world is looking for. This is the house he wants to build. And where the living stones with which he builds it? God specifically commands that these two sets of five curtains, these two houses, house of Israel and the house of Judah, these pictures of his righteousness be coupled together as one, forming what? Hamishkan Ekad, or one tabernacle. Remember, it's one king, one people. He's bringing this called the restoration, and they're going to be coming together as one tabernacle. It's the house of Judah and the house of Israel. Jehovah prepared from the beginning for his true people to be one. To teach otherwise is actually to go against or try to destroy the Torah and the prophets. Because Ezekiel 37 makes it clear for the start. And Matthew 5, 17 says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. He came so that this tabernacle could be one. Coupled together, oneness of fellowship. <laughs> Isaiah 8 20 says that the Lord to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. If you don't see this coming and you don't see this oneness in fellowship, then there's no light because it's all the way through his word. And one John says this, talking about light. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. It's there again. And the blood of Yeshua, the Son, cleanses us from all sin. He's building his people, and it's it's all pictured for us in this tabernacle, and it's beautiful, isn't it? Now the two sets of curtains are to become one. Yet in appearance to the naked eye, they are still two sets of curtains. Oh, oh. <laughs> the picture of two, but yet one, is also seen in the observance of shadow oaks in Leviticus 23:15 to 22. When Yahweh introduces this feast to his people. He tells them to bring out of their habitations two wave loaves, each baked with leaven and containing the exact same ingredients. When the completed loaves are seen, they are seen as two loaves, but inside they are exactly the same. Again, it's a representation of the two houses. It might look different, but they're exactly the same. Now, teaching one set of laws for the Jew and one set of laws for everyone else is nonsense. Right, it's not found anywhere in the scriptures. Two loaves of bread, exactly the same. Okay, just like the two curtains that are going to be joined together. In Exodus 12, 49, it says, One law shall be to him that is homeborn, and unto the stranger that sojourneth the monkey. One law? Because he's building one tabernacle and one king over one nation. So how are these two sets of curtains to be coupled? It tells us 50 loops of blue and 50 tashes of gold. And what does that speak of? Spirit of God and his work are easily connected with the number 50. So all these details that he just named, they're all there for a reason. The only, oh, I do it myself, I'm not bothering. Sometimes I do anyway. The obvious connection is with the 50 day period between the Feast of First Fruits and the Feast of Shadowhawk. The followers of Jehovah were made one by his presence on Mount Sinai, just as they were in Jerusalem some 1200 years later. Ephesians 4 3 says this, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Okay, the Spirit brings unity. The prophet spoke of the rebuilding, the restoration, Amos 9 11. In that day will I raise up the tabernacle of David that has fallen and close up the breaches thereof, and I will raise up his ruins and I will build it as in the days of old. Prophetic again. <laughs> it's got to be built again. It's amazing, isn't it? The two houses, the two gardens are going to be coupled together again. The bringing together of the two houses by the Ruach HaKadosh as seen in the tabernacle furnishings could also be seen in another occurrence of 50 which is called the Jubilee. The Jubilee year for those who don't know every 50 years. We'll come to it later in Torah if you're not sure of it. Leviticus 25.10 says, And ye shall hallow the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a Jubilee unto you and you shall return every man unto his possession and ye shall return every man unto his family. The physical return of the whole house of Israel is also directly associated with the Spirit of God. The 50th year, the year of Jubilee is when every man will return to his possession, when Israel will return and the Spirit of Jehovah will be poured out upon us. Now, 
It's not where the even the colours, mm. but the loots of the curtains were to be the same colour as the zitzit or fringes. These things that we wear to have the colour blue in them. Because there's a relationship between the holiness of God as expressed through his commandments and the colour blue. The golden clasps can only be present when there are the blue loops to hang from. Are we getting that? Yeah. The clasps are the rings that hold all the curtains together. Right. It is admittedly the Ruach HaKadosh, the Spirit that unites God's people. But the Spirit of God must have something by which to hold us together. The blue loops. It is the faith, trust of his children that forms the loops that holds us together. Obedience again. It is not an intellectual profession of facts about God. It's living it. That's what's important. Because the demons believe there's a God. It tells us in James 2, 19. But Acts 5, says this. Spirit is given to those who obey. The obedience is just represented here as the blue loops. Okay, now gold is both the colour and the metal, and as both colour and metal is associated with kings and things pertaining to kings and kingdoms, gold is not easily corruptible. Gold is a standard by which other things are judged. So we've got the two sets of curtains which represent the two houses. Each house is joined together as one by the bond of fellowship, and this is why Yeshua says that the people will know us by our love for one another. These two houses are likewise joined by the bond of fellowship. House of Israel and the House of Judah. And this too becoming one happens when the Ruach is poured out and the Spirit joins those who are holy and faithful in keeping the commandments. He is reckoned as righteous by His grace through faith. He is rebuilding the tabernacle of David for His glory. And that was a lovely little story for you. Love one another with brotherly affection and do one another in showing God. I'm just going to finish on this because it's so lovely. I think I've mentioned this before, but in case you've forgotten. This is an Angitang, right? <clears throat> he was in a bad way and he was brought into an animal rescue centre. And he was beat up and desperate. And they tried everything, but this monkey just basically wanted to die, it wouldn't eat, it wouldn't do anything and it wouldn't interact whatsoever. And one of the people who worked there, right, he turned up one day and brought his dog in. And the dog, <laughs> the dog kind of bowsied over to the monkey and something happened and they became friends. And because of this fellowship that the monkey had with the dog, it started to get back its will to live. The sight started improving again and, and he just became inseparable and it was just like the monkey started thriving and its illnesses all went it just started becoming dead healthy and vital and he wouldn't go anywhere without the dog it's so lovely and some of these pictures are absolutely insane but it just shows you the power of oneness in fellowship and what it can do it's incredible now look <laughs> in my mind I just think it's great, this whole thing. <laughs> it just tell my the expression of his face. I'm made up. The monkey is his thing. And the dog's made up as well. And they do everything together. Absolutely everything. Right? I just think it's brilliant. Colossians 3.16 says this. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in Psalms hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Fellowship is massively important. He's building his house with a bunch of people who are coupled together, oneness in fellowship. You can see the power of it here in this daft story which just tickles me. And look, it's a good thing to so should we break again into some tea? And we'll admonish each other with singing and psalms in a bit. A little outline of what we've got ahead of us. Chapter 36 continues with more details about putting things, you know, like we broke down then with the curtains and all that kind of Now, chapter 37 talks about the making of the ark, the making of the table, the making of the lampstand, making the altar of incense, making the altar of burnt offering, making the bronze basin, and making the outer court. So, all that's the information in chapter 37. And then we come to Padukai. I was made up to find out that two poor portions to study this. <laughs> it's like, okay, 
So this is Paducah is the second one. Now Paducah starts like this. This is the sum of the tabernacle, even of the tabernacle of testimony. We'll come to that in a bit, tabernacle of testimony. As it was counted according to the commandments of Moshe for the service of the Levites by the hand of Ithamar, son to Adam the priest. Now the Hebrew word Paducah is a construct noun derived from the Hebrew verb root Pachad, which generally means to visit, to pay attention to, to closely observe, to muster, or to cause, to pass in review. The first biblical use of this verb is found in Genesis 21, and there we're told in Genesis 21, 1 to 2, Yehovah Pachad visited Sarah as he had said, and Yehovah did to Sarah as he had spoken. So he conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the time set in which Jehovah had spoken to him. At the time set, the Lord's in control of the time, what we said. Now the Hebraic word picture presented by the, the Hebrew word, the verb, pakat, is that of a visitation for a specific purpose. Okay? And the image you can consider is this. The image of a shepherd inspected his sheep by having each one pass under his rod. As each animal is uh, in his charge passes through a gate of a narrow opening, the shepherd stops the animal with his rod, makes it hold still, more or less anyway, while he inspects it. And all the while, of course, what the shepherd does is he talks to or he sings to the animal and he calms it and he trains it to know and to trust his voice, taking his relationship with the animal to a deeper level. So, the dukai involves much more than accounting it is intimate accountability, it's a moment of truth, it's evaluation for the purpose of promotion and correction. I think we all could do with Paducah, couldn't we? Having the shepherd master inspect us closely and sing to us to <laughs> lay our fears while he starts up where we're at and what we need. Now as I said before, we are in the Mills and Boo period here and it's very much so in this Torah portion. It's considered a high point because 22 times in the concluding chapters of Exodus we will find the following words which constitute the unmistakable theme of this parsha, which is Kasha Tiva Adonai and Moshe exactly as Jehovah instructed Moshe. That's the honeymoon period. Exactly as Jehovah instructed Moshe. If we could all stick to that we'd be in the honeymoon bliss. That's, that's what this Parsha is all about. Now, are we in the appointed time of Jehovah for us to approach the Torah in the same way, with the same spirit as our ancestors approached the building of the Mishkan in the time of Paducah? Is that where we're at? Remember before we were looking at it, was Moses going, Stop! Stop! You're bringing too much stuff! Right? Are we in this frame of mind where we just recognize we've got no other hope but our Creator? We love him. He's forgiven us. He's taken us from Egypt. Wow, we fat for, but he still wants us back. We love him. We're just going to do it according to his word, according to all that he commanded Moses. Where do we find Moses? The first five books of the Bible, the Torah. According to all that's in that, if we do this, we'll be spot on. Now, the structure of the redeemed community built at the foot of Mount Sinai was properly described earlier as the tabernacle of the testimony because of what the Mishkan contained at its core and its essence. At the spiritual epicenter of the Mishkan, the tabernacle was the ark contained in the tablets, and these tablets were inscribed by the finger of God and delivered after the sin of the golden calf, and this testified to the world of Jehovah's forgiveness, his unfailing love, his unshakable covenant, and his absolute commitment to the redemption and restoration of such as would shimar his voice. What a powerful statement. Now the rest of the chapter <coughs> is all about accounting. Upon the Mishkan's completion, Moshe decides that he should make an inspection, take an inventory of the materials used and make an account. And among other things this will accomplish, Moshe wants the people whose gifts and blood, sweat and tears and talent were employed in the project to know where every single contribution they made wound up. And I thought he had any guesses on how much it cost in today's money. Any? Any guesses? Well, a hundred quid. Right, it's for the tent. Remember, it's for the tent. How much do you think? Ten thousand quid. Okay. Look, it's going to send me right to the beginning again. Never mind. Let's get back to the penny jar. 
But just think about it, they were all slaves. They were, you know, we're not talking about a bunch of people who went to Harvard <laughs> or went to Eton and had good jobs and wore pinstripe suits. They were just a big bunch of slaves. Well, how are you thinking? Now how are you thinking? I like it. Okay, let's find it. This is ridiculous, isn't it? The way it makes me do this. We just get to see the monkey again. Fifty-five million dollars. That's that's about a rough estimate of what we've got, which is amazing, isn't it? Because it's a bunch of slaves. They traded everything they had of value in the world for the opportunity to have the manifest presence of Jehovah travel in their midst. Are we willing to give everything we've got of value for the same purpose? They recognize with great thankfulness, as we should, the mercy that they've been shown. This is in the post Golden Calf, remember, the we. Now, most of these are pictured of the Messiah, doesn't even know this. He was the agent that Jehovah used to bring the people out of bondage. We were in bondage to sin. Yeshua set us free. These people are grateful, so we should be as most of them. Moshe led the people out of Egypt just as Yeshua has delivered us and set us apart. He says, You're not of this world anymore. Get out. Moshe also empowered, was empowered to be the agent of renewing the covenant that Jehovah had made with Abraham, then with Isaac, then with Jacob, and with his sons. And in doing so, he took a ragtag bunch of misfits. He gave them purpose and identity, just as Yeshua has in taking us and bringing us back into covenant and grafting us into his nation, Israel. He's a type, isn't he? And these people, look how they responded. Oh, they couldn't get enough of it, couldn't they? they just couldn't do enough. I just love the pity of them sitting there and making goat things and spinning the way and, and just bringing that much stuff <laughs> and is saying stop stop oh but we want to it's just lovely isn't it? they were just in love with the Lord chapter 39 begins with the making of the priestly garments and in verse 14 it says and the stones were according to the names of the children of Israel 12 according to their names like the engravings of the signet every one with his name according to the 12 tribes now it's interesting but the 12 stones that are inset into the breastplate, you can see the picture there, are engraved with names. It doesn't say that the stones are engraved with the tribes of the children of Israel, it says with the names. There's something about that that just stood out to me. We are the children of Israel. Now this piece of his garment was worn over his heart of the high priest and is even noted to be immovable. So what does this tell us about our high priest? And our names written across his heart. Chapter 39 ends with this. According to all that the Lord commanded Moshe, so the children of Israel made all the work. Moshe did look upon all the work, and behold, they had done it as the Lord had commanded. Even so, they had done it. And Moshe blessed them, just as the Lord commanded. Again, it's just, we'd have to be soft not to notice, wouldn't we, what it's trying to tell us. Are you curious about the blessing that Moshe said? <clears throat> okay, the sages believe they figured out what Moshe said. And they reckon it's Psalm 90, because it's the only psalm that's attributed to Moshe. If you read how it begins, it seems to point to the tabernacle. Let's have a look. It begins with a, a prayer of Moshe, the man of Elohim. Adonai, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. And then the psalm ends. <clears throat> and if you read it as a blessing that he must have given to the children of Israel, it ends like this in verse 17. And let the beauty of Jehovah our Elohim be upon us and establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. The phrase, the work of our hands, must surely refer to the tabernacle. And therefore, this prayer of Moshe, Psalm 90, must be understood to be the prayer and blessing that he pronounced at the completion of the tabernacle. So it's a good one to go home and read and think, well, that's where it is, isn't it? Psalm 90. Now, verse 40, uh, says, chapter 14, well, it says, And Jehovah has spoken to Moshe, saying, On the first day of the first month shall thou set up the tabernacle of the tent of congregation. Now, as the bomb was alluded to before, in regard to any spiritual endeavor, there is not only the matter of divine design to be considered, there is also the critical matter of divine timing. Now, the first day of the first month is not January the 1st. It's always been to us, isn't it, because we grew up in this world that's all cockeyed and messed up and not in tune with God at all. But that's not what it is. 
According to Torah, all events of spiritual time are to be reckoned from and considered in relation to the first day of the lunar month in which the Exodus occurred. In Exodus 12, 1 to 2, Yehovah spake and said unto Moshe and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months when they left. It shall be the first month of the year to you, known as the first of Nisan. So the first of Nisan is a time for everyone to say, Happy New Year! Okay? Torah so considers the first day of Nisan in the year following the Exodus. So this is a year on from when they left. Considers it um, so important that it's spectacular events or the narrative of three different books. It's in Exodus, Leviticus and Numbers. So the bit where they actually make the tabernacle and it's completed, that's so amazing to the Lord that's in three of the books. Now from verse 2 to 15, Jehovah instructs Moshe regarding the procedure he wants us to follow in connection with the assembly of the Mishkan's components. And it goes in steps. And I'll just read them to you. It's the placement of the ark, the closing of the veil, the setting up of um, setting the bread on the table, setting up the light in the menorah, setting up and inaugurating the golden altar of incense, setting up and inaugurating the brazen altar, setting up and filling the water and inaugurating the bronze labour, and then setting up the outer court and then the way. Please note that Jehovah's assembly instructions start from the inside and they work their way out. We should realise that from the inside out is the way spiritual things are supposed to work. That's a kind of scary picture, that, isn't it, by the way? We're not to worry about what is on the outside to the detriment of what is on the inside. It's what the Lord's doing on the inside that's more important. That it works its way out anyway. You can see it in people's faces, can't you? Mike says he gets people up there, and we don't know what that's about. You know? <laughs> it's the Lord working from the inside out. No, he does. He says, because they can see something. You know? Now the Hebrew word, which our English Bibles translate by the phrase set up. So he set up his tent. Okay, it's not quite, doesn't really give it the, quite the right context. In Exodus 40, 17, that's the word that's used. Coup, right? And it means to rise, arise, stand, rise up, stand up from the seat of the bed, to come on the scene, to be established, to be confirmed, to be fixed, to be valid, to be proven, to be fulfilled, to be set, to be fixed. Now, examples of it in the text, now we've got Genesis 9-11, I will establish my covenant. So it's a bit more than just putting a few tent pegs in and stuff, isn't it? I will establish my covenant with you, neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of the flood. Isaiah 44, verse 26, and I will raise up your ruins. Raise up is this word again. Cool. So for Moses to set up the Mishkan meant more than just pitching a tent. There was more going on here. Something was being established. Now, that phrase, it just has to be mentioned again, just as the Holy One instructed. It's in Exodus. This is it just in this chapter alone, the last chapter. Verse 19, 21, 23, 25, 29, 32. Okay? For once, we, the people of God, did exactly what Jehovah said. We did not add to Jehovah's instructions, nor did we subtract from them. We did not twist them to suit our fancy. We did not build something to show off our creativity or attract the crowd to us. We did not come up with what we deem to be a more visitor-friendly Okay, and as this occurred, what happened? When we did just as he instructed, Jehovah manifested in glory amongst us. When we did exactly as he asked us to do. Like from verse 18 to 31, Moshe does all that Jehovah has commanded him in setting up the tabernacle. And there's something that's interesting. The difference between Vayakal and Pekudai. In Pekudai, the phrase, as Jehovah commanded Moshe, appears 14 times. In addition, it appears five other times with slight adjustments. And Paduke actually appropriately ends with, so Moshe finished the work. Now, in contrast, Vayakal does not contain this phrase, not even once. Why? This is why. After Moshe sets the bread on the table, we can finish with the phrase, as Jehovah had commanded Moshe. This same process applies to the ark, which is built according to the pattern, but completed by Moshe when he places the testimony inside. Also, it applies to the menorah, which, without the preparation of its lights by Moshe, cannot be a shining lampstand. In fact, the Dukai follows Moshe around through the tabernacle as he completes each vessel. Right? So we've seen this character, Bezalel, 
he's made the vessels but Moshe gets the credit for their completion because he sets them up and finishes them with what? Bread, water, light and the word. Can you see? It is the Messiah that is necessary for completion. Because he's all that things, isn't he? Torah is fulfilled, okay? Moshe did everything as commanded by Jehovah when the Messiah is brought into the picture through the bread, the water and the light and the word of the testimony by the hand of Moshe. Without these items, the vessels of the tabernacle are absolutely nothing but furniture. It is not the objects that are holy, it is human action and intention in accordance with the will of Jehovah that creates holiness and brings Messiah into the picture. Messiah has to be in the picture for it to be complete. It's nothing without it. It's nothing without him. It's not. Verse 32. When they went into the tent of the congregation and when they came near unto the altar, they washed as Jehovah commanded Moshe. And he veered up the court round about the tabernacle and the altar. And he set up the hanging of the court gate. So Moshe finished the work. Wonderful. Well, if I see, finished the work, no. Like I said before, this is all about relationship. This is not. The word for finished is the Hebrew word, kala. It is the root word for the word for bride, kala. A bride completes her husband as the two become one. And this is the connection of the tabernacle with the bride and Messiah. Who is it that finishes the work? It's Moses. Moses is synonymous with the Torah. Only Torah has the power to take all the component parts of the tabernacle, put them together and make them into one. It is Torah that will finish the bride and usher in the heavenly kingdom. It's lovely, don't it? Ah, verse 34 says, Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. What a thing. It's just crazy, isn't it, the scripture? You don't need to just say something like that. And then, and, and, yeah, and the glory of the Lord filled the time. It's like, wow, well, hang on. We just read it and don't think that we go, just imagine what it was like. All the effort they do putting into it. You know, moaning about who's got the best goat spinning skills and all this. And they brought it, I mean, wouldn't it? He wouldn't nap me things, would he? He said that we'd already brought and all this is going on. But there must have been excitement for them to be so, you know, fervently given and doing all this work. And then, on this day, New Year's Day as well. Fireworks. Here we go. The glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moshe was not able to enter. Hang on. Not even Moshe was able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode there on and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Right. It was as if they were back under the hoop again on Mount Sinai. The cloud was the hoop, wasn't it? This is what people get married under. He's forgiven his people. For their adultery with a false god. Not only that, this is even better. And I've just put it here, it's not like us. I'll forgive yet, but it will never be the same. <laughs> so that's like the human way, isn't it? Yeah, alright. Well I'll let you off, but do This is this is not the Lord, this is not what he's like. This time the presence is so amazing that even Moshe can't enter. Unlike Sinai when he walked right into the cloud. That's what our God's like. He forgives us in a way that we can't even comprehend. You know what I Because we did, haven't we? I'll forgive you. Every time you see the person, I tell you, yeah, all right. <laughs> the Lord's not like that. He forgives us and gives us, and it just brings us closer to him. It's just incredible, isn't it? I'm no shame, man. He must have tried to walk in, must he? I'm like, oh, God, what's happening? This, is, this, isn't, this isn't normal. This is incredible. It says, and when the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went on in all their journeys. But if the cloud were not taken up, then they journeyed not till the day that it was taken up. They followed his cue. The cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day, and fire was on it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. That is the end in there of Exodus. So, it leads us to just have a little talk about what is a 15 chapter chiasm that ends Exodus. Does everybody know what a chiasm is? Okay, I'll explain what a chiasm is. Chiasm is, is where you've got a story that begins with something and ends with the same thing. Then the second thing that happens is like the second to last thing that happened. 
the third thing that happens is like the third to last thing that happens and they meet in the middle and something's going on and the scriptures are absolutely jam-packed with them it's one of the things that makes people go no way this has got to be written by the supernatural because it's just mind-boggling the things that go on exodus has got a 15 chapter one and what's noticed is in, in the chiasm, there's other chiasms as well, and we'll have a little quick look. See, this is the chiasm. If you look, the first thing that happens, God's presence on Mount Sinai is mirrored by God's presence in the tabernacle. They move in, they get the command to build the tabernacle, then on the other side, building the tabernacle, then there's a command to observe the Sabbath. We just read about it, didn't we, earlier you know, when you come down off the mountain, the first thing he says, observe the Sabbath. In the middle, you've got the golden calf. Okay, so you've got an idea now what a chiasm is, yeah? Okay, now I just want to go back to this because I think it's important. When Jehovah enters the Mishkan and fills it, His holiness is so intense in this place specially made for Him that Moshe can't even enter. In building the Mishkan, what they've done is they've rebuilt the relationship with Jehovah and they built it always according to all that He had told Moshe. Okay, that's how they rebuilt it. Now, they rebuilt their relationship with Jehovah to the extent that he dwells with them now in a way that dwarfs the Mount Sinai experience. God's not the top of a God-made mountain. He's dwelling in the man-made Mishkan. Right? And here, there's fire too. Fire by night. At first there was a cloud with fire, and now there seem to be two that are separated. First it was terrifying, and now it's comforting. And I just put it here. But if you walk in obedience and do it all according to what the Lord says, it becomes comforting to you. But if you walk in disobedience, I think you're probably quite terrifying. So it depends where you want to be. I actually stood up in the school assembly when I was a kid and uh, preached. Didn't go down well, got lettuce sent home, questioning my mental stability and things. I <laughs> <laughs> sent to the headmaster's office and all that. And I just remember what I said. I said, yeah, Jesus Christ is Lord. Imagine them, there's a school, all the lads on that side going, <laughs> and all the girls tittering, and the teachers. And uh, I said, Jesus Christ is Lord, is what I called him. And you know, I'd meet him now as a friend, or later as a judge. That's all I pretty much said, and then I sat down, and then I got the, you know, Dan's brass, <laughs> my <laughs> office. And it's odd because I'd, I'd asked if I could do it, because the Lord gave me a vision that I should. And I asked the teacher, and she said, no, you shouldn't do that, because you'll offend people from other religions. And I said, but Lord, she doesn't want me to. If I'm supposed to do it, somebody's got to pat me on the shoulder and say, no, God is with you. And I was like, okay. The day of the assembly, my friend Graham Jennings turned around and tapped me and said, God is with you. I felt the power of God come on me, but it freed me out that much, I didn't stand up. So I had to wait two weeks, and then uh, I did stand up. And, uh, said those words and <laughs> the place went nuts. What was lovely is afterwards that weekend the pastor said I've got this bit of scripture I don't know what it's about and it's the bit where Stephen is stoned and it says Stephen looked up and saw Yeshua standing at the right hand of the Father. He said the Lord pointed something out to me. So everywhere else in the scripture it says he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. He said well at this moment <laughs> he's freaking out him. He was stood because he was like wow Man. Threw me out that bit. <clears throat> when he shared that with me and I realised, wow, don't we sometimes forget that when we serve the most high God? And he cares, he wants a relationship with us, it's real, it's you know. We don't even we don't we can't even really give him much, can we? But we should give him all that we can. But yeah, we are to meet him now in obedience and it's beautiful and we're comforted by his presence or it can be terrifying if we want to walk in disobedience now at the beginning and end of this god's presence on mount sinai and god's presence in the tabernacle them two things which are part of that 15 chapter chiasm have chiasms built into them themselves now <clears throat> this is how it works in exodus 24 you can see that it begins with Moshe went up to the mount it ends with and when up into the mount. Second part, the glory of Jehovah abode upon Sinai. And it says, <clears throat> there we go, the same thing again. And he appeared to the glory of Jehovah with like a divided fire. It all comes to a point in the middle where it is actually, he called unto Moshe. Okay? 
So what you've got is this happening. Most of them went up the mountain. He went up the mountain to the other side. The cloud covered the mountain. <laughs> Moses went into the cloud. See how it mirrors itself. And it all points to this verse in the middle which is God called to Moses. Right? You're probably thinking, yeah, big deal, <laughs> what's that? You know. Okay, I thought that the middle would be something amazing and fantastic. But it isn't, it's just God called to Moshe. Okay? So what you've got, the picture of it here is this big 15 chapter chiasm. The beginning of it begins with a chiasm with that God called to Moses in the middle. And if you go to the end here, God's presence in the tabernacle, there's another chiasm, okay? Then the cloud covered the tent, and whenever the cloud was taken up from over Israel, and it meets in the middle, and it meets with, into the tent of meeting. Oh, what's the most big deal is this? The big 15 chapter chiasm, and all this, and then you've got these two bits on the end, and they mean this. So, there we've got the cloud covers the tent, the cloud lifts, and the big, as I say, in the middle is to the tent of meeting. Okay. So, the beginning, we've got God's presence on Mount Sinai with a chiasm that says God called to Moses. At the end, we've got God's presence in the tabernacle and it's this chiasm leading to this phrase to the tent of meeting. And it's interesting, isn't it? It's like these chiasms. Like I said, the structure of the scriptures is just beyond our comprehension because we just can't get our head around it. The way you'll find them yourself if you look for them there's these patterns all the way through the scriptures and like wow you know sometimes when something's repeated and you think it's like when that happened before actually what's happening is there's a big chiastic structure happening designed to lead you to a point in the middle which is significant okay now having gone through all this god calls about the sense of meeting let's just ask ourselves how does the next book of the Torah begin because this is nuts Okay, Exodus 24, God called to Moshe, Exodus 40, to the tent of meeting, the next book, Leviticus 1, God called to Moshe from the tent of meeting. It's not, isn't it? And the scriptures are full of things like this. All set up perfectly, just to lead us right into the next book, <laughs> which is Leviticus, which JP will take us through next week. But, this is another thing that we probably have spent all our lives missing when we read the scriptures. We've not known that these things are there. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a thing that you can investigate in your own time. But there's actually quite a lot of stuff you can find out, my dear. So, should we pray? <laughs>